Hi, I'm Jared Gardner. Today we're going to talk about a tumor that uh, causes a lot of confusion for pathologists, both for its name and because of its deceptively benign appearance. This is low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. Yes, it's another one of those tumors with myxo and fibro in the name that uh, cause a lot of confusion because it sounds similar to an another type of tumor we see in soft tissue that's called myxofibrosarcoma. So this one is uh, also known as Evans tumor, named after the person who first described it in the 1980s, Harry Evans, a very famous soft tissue pathologist from MD Anderson. I had the the distinct privilege of being able to work with Dr. Evans a little bit during my training in Houston, Texas. Um, and he's really an amazing pathologist. So this tumor was, was only described relatively recently because it does not look malignant usually. It looks benign and so it's often misdiagnosed uh, because of that. Additionally, it, it does uh, behave in a malignant fashion, but often in a very delayed manner. It can metastasize decades after its initial presentation. So by that time, the patient may have moved, forgotten all about the, the, the supposedly benign mass they had removed years and years ago. And so that's why it took a long time for people to figure out that, uh, that this was actually a malignancy. So the, the way, and I'm, I'm making a separate video, which I'll put a link up in the upper right hand corner here and also in the video description. I'm making a video to quickly explain in, in uh, a, a, quick, uh, a quick overview of explaining how to tell apart low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma from myxofibrosarcoma. The names sound similar, but they're very different tumors histologically and are easy to separate most of the time just on H&E. But this video is going to be all about low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, so this is the more in-depth look at this entity. The first thing I want you to notice is that this tumor is pink overall. Yes, it has a few areas that are kind of pale and a bluish myxoid. The blue is a little bit hard. This, this slide's a little bit older, and so the, the bluish myxoid background fades out um, kind of quickly on H&E. But the, the predominant color here is pink, and I think this is one easy way to help remember this. Fibromyxoid. The name says fibro before the word myxo. So the fibro is the pink part. The myxoid is the bluish pale part, and these tumors usually, not always, but usually have a predominantly fibrous pink component and a lesser myxoid bluish component. So it looks more pink. The, um, the way I also remember it is some of the original tumors that, that Dr. Evans described were misdiagnosed originally as either fibroma, which is a good example of why it's dangerous to call something just fibroma, not otherwise specified, just because you see a spindle cell thing that looks fibroblastic and benign um, and you don't have a good name for it, it doesn't mean it's a fibroma. That's the way that tumors like this get missed. And the other thing is that these can get confused for neurofibromas. So that pinkish um, a bland appearance and the pink fibrous background can easily um, get confused with other things. Also desmoid fibromatosis. I've got a video about that. I'll put a link um, uh, down in the comment or in the video description below. You can watch that if you're curious about desmoid tumors. Those are all fibrous fibroblastic tumors that are or tumors with a fibroblastic looking background that can get confused with this tumor. So let's go down and look closer here and see what we have. So let's look at the fibrous areas first. The fibrous areas have a very fine, I'm going to leave the condenser flipped here so that it's a little bit out of focus, but the reason for that is so you can see these fine, delicate little fibers of collagen. The background of collagen in low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, in my experience, tends to be very delicate like this, which is part of why it can easily mimic a neurofibroma, because neurofibromas tend to have this real fine little threads of collagen in their background with uh, kind of pale areas in between, a little bit of very slightly myxoid stuff that's separating those collagen fibers apart. Let me flip the condenser back so we can see it more clearly. So this is what it looks like without the condenser on. Again, very delicate, stringy, fine collagen. And in between, these bland, bland, thin, not atypical at all, fibroblastic looking cells. I mean, I could show anyone a picture of that, one picture, that does not look malignant. It looks totally benign by all of the rules that we usually use to assess malignancy histologically and cytologically. This is the most important take home point from this whole video. These tumors do not usually look malignant and because of that, if you don't recognize the pattern, it is so easy to misdiagnose them 
as a benign thing. So I think a couple ways to avoid that is A, don't look at this and say, oh look, it's a benign and it looks fibroblastic, let's call it a fibroma, don't do that. The other thing, one of my mentors, my, my, one of my greatest mentors, the one who made me decide to pursue academic medicine and teaching, Dr. Jay Rowe from Houston Methodist Hospital, what he told me, it was I think some great advice, he said if you see a lesion that you think is a neoplasm and you think it's a benign neoplasm but you don't know a name for it, don't just sign it out and, and diagnose it as benign neoplasm not otherwise specified unless you're an expert in that particular subspecialty. Go and show it to an expert if you have a case like that. And the reason is, is that, it, yeah, maybe most of the time you'll be okay doing that, but you're gonna end up having things like this that are known entities that don't look malignant. In soft tissue, we have quite a few of these. We have low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, uh, myxoid liposarcoma, also looks totally benign most of the time unless you recognize the pattern. So this is another one of those tumors where the histologic pattern is really the key to recognizing the diagnosis. So I'm gonna go in even higher power to convince you. Yes, these are sarcoma cells right here. They just don't look very atypical at all. They look bland, they don't usually have pleomorphism, they look uniform, they look very much like each other and look very fibroblastic. And, um, and again, this is, I've talked in other videos, this is a true statement about many of the translocation associated sarcomas. And they have the same molecular abnormality in every single cell, so all the cells look alike. They look monotonous and uniform rather than pleomorphic, okay? So there's a few exceptions to this we'll talk about in a minute. But this is the, the cytologic feature of low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. So that's the fibrous area, delicate collagen kind of in the background, little tiny bit of myxoid stuff, bland spindle cells. Let's move to the myxoid area. Here in the myxoid areas, the cells sometimes get a little bit larger. Some of them are kind of rounded or triangle shaped, but even still, we really just don't see anything that looks like marked atypia or pleomorphism, which is distinctly different from myxofibrosarcoma, which again, I have another video about that. I'll put a link in the video description and up in the upper right-hand corner. Myxofibrosarcomas are by definition pleomorphic sarcomas. They're aneuploid, they do not have translocations, they have random gains and losses, and thus they have pleomorphism. So even in grade one, the low grade form of myxofibrosarcoma, you have to have pleomorphism. That's a different tumor than this low grade fibromyxoid sarcoma or Evans tumor, which usually does not have pleomorphism. Okay, so the myxoid areas here, uh, look a little different than the fibrous areas. So I'm going to go back to lower power and the the way to kind of start thinking about this tumor when you see it at low power is anytime I see a, a tumor at low power like this that's got pink fibrous zones blending and intermingling with pale bluish myxoid zones and I see areas that have a little bit of increased cellularity kind of like up here the cellularity is a little higher here and then areas of sclerotic kind of collagen with very low cellularity here, that is to me the low power clue, the red flag that says, wait, could I be dealing with a low grade fibromyxoid sarcoma? Fibrous pink stuff mingled with pale blue myxoid stuff and more cellular areas like this intermingled with less cellular areas. Those features right there always make me think I have to exclude low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. With some practice, and hopefully after this video, you'll have seen enough cases that you can start to recognize, there are some very distinct features, I think, that, that at higher power that, that are kind of subtle, the nuances like that fine collagen and something like the vascular pattern um, that can, can help you sort this out. And then, of course, we can use ancillary testing but I think from low power, it's important to always have this entity in your mind when you see a soft tissue tumor that looks benign and has kind of pinkish and bluish mingled areas, that's a really important time to make sure you rule out low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, okay? The, uh, the areas that are more myxoid tend to get a little bit of the increased cellularity, like you can see here. The more collagenous or fibrous looking areas tend to be less cellular, and sometimes you can even have big zones that are kind of sclerotic and very, very low cellularity. Let's see if these areas here, the cells, see the cells are very spaced out from one another. They've got a lot of extra collagen in between them. And again, they look so, so bland and benign. It's hard to believe that this is a malignant tumor. These are malignant actually, um, although at five years of follow-up, 
the majority of patients have no metastases or aggressive behavior. If you follow patients much longer, the picture changes quite a bit and a significant subset, somewhere around 40 or even maybe even higher percent will eventually get metastases if you follow them over decades. And that's what's so unusual about this tumor. Not only does it look benign, it is a very, very different behavior than other sarcomas. Most high-grade sarcomas metastasize oftentimes within five years of diagnosis if they're going to metastasize. Now, that's not always true, but oftentimes that's the case. This tumor is so different. The, I think the median time to metastasis in a large uh, retrospective study by Harry Evans, I think that was published in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology 2011. I'll put a link in the, the video description. If you follow them for many, many years, the, the average time, or I think it was the median time actually to recurrence or to metastasis was 15 years. That's so strange, right? To have a tumor that waits 15 years to eventually spread or, or, or recur. And that's not all. There are cases reported that are actually 30 or even 40 years out from the original diagnosis when a metastasis finally shows up. So unfortunately, that's a frustrating thing, I think, for both the treating physicians and the patients to know that, that Basically, you're never totally in the clear. These things can recur or metastasize very, very long after diagnosis. When they metastasize, they often go to the lung or the pleura, and um, there probably is some benefit, uh, at least at least in the opinion of some of the, the people that I know who treat these sarcomas, in removing solitary metastases from the lung if they're surgically amenable to surgical resection, that you can remove the metastasis and then the patient may go some quite a few more years before having another metastasis. So you can really kind of prolong the disease course by removing metastases. Obviously, if you're a patient watching this that has this tumor, please make sure you see an expert um, uh, who has experience with this tumor uh, for getting your care. All right, so again, look here at this very pink hypocellular kind of sclerotic areas, a little bit more pale myxoid areas. This intermingled pink and blue is the key for low-grade fiber myxoid sarcoma. Let's look at a few other cases. Here's another one that's very, very pink. It's very fibrous in appearance. This one, you could kind of think of maybe solitary fibrous tumor. It's got dilated, kind of branching, almost staghorn looking vessels. But again, it's got this area here of increased cellularity, areas of much lower cellularity over here. It's got this fine, look at that, very fine, delicate thread-like collagen in the background. The spindle cells are very thin and bland. And sometimes if you, depending on which way the cells are kind of sectioned, they can look a little more oval or even round. And I think this is similar. That's why this tumor, uh, one of the mimics that you can see, one of the histologic mimics is perineurioma. And I have another video about perineurioma that really goes into detail. Perineuriomas often have cells that look very much like this. And both perineurioma as well as low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma can have very whirled or swirled areas. This one's not really showing that, but some of them do. They have a lot of whirling pattern. So the, the two other things to keep in the differential here are perineurioma and also dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, DFSP, which also has a, a tends to have a story form or whirled and swirled growth pattern, and also has a translocation sarcoma, has very bland. Uh, spindle cells, okay? I guess I don't have any immunostains uh, with me to show you today, but just briefly, the immunostains, most of the immunostains that we use uh, for soft tissue tumors are negative most of the time in low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. CD34 is usually negative, which is a pretty easy way to separate this from DFSP. The other thing is that low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma usually is a, a relatively larger and deep, deep soft tissue below the fascia mass. Although there are rare examples that are small and superficial, and those seem to be more common in children. But DFSP is essentially always in the skin, the dermis or subcutis, and rarely ever involves the deep soft tissue. So that's another easy way, that plus CD34. Perineurioma is more of a difficult problem because perineurioma has a lot of overlap histologically with low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma and also immunohistochemically. The, on immunostains, EMA, Claudin-1 and GLUT-1 are three immunostains that will usually stain perineuriomas. The problem is, is that low-grade fibromyxoid sarcomas often express at least focal EMA, so that's a problem. And additionally, 
the 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 examples of low grade fiber mixoid sarcoma that have dramatic swirling and whirling growth those are the, the ones that have a perineurioma like pattern the ones that mimic perineurioma they also often or almost always express clot in one at least according to some studies so that's a real pitfall that it looks like a perineurioma it stains like perineurioma glute one uh, at least to my knowledge is usually negative but i think i've seen one case report that reported positive staining for glute in a low grade fiber mixoid sarcoma so not not usual, but in any case, with um, with that differential, what you have to do here is do some ancillary testing. The one stain that um, was described a few years ago as being helpful here is called MUC4, M-U-C-4. MUC4 is in the setting of a fibroblastic spindle cell tumor like this. It is a very sensitive and specific marker, at least as of today's date in, in 2018. So far, it tends to be a very sensitive and specific marker for low-grade fiber mixoid sarcoma and it should be negative in perineuriomas and DFSP and other entities in the differential diagnosis. Now I'm sure eventually someone will find an example of other tumors like that that, that will stain for MUC4. Uh, the one main exception is that um, uh, synovial sarcomas, monophasic synovial sarcoma, a subset of those will stain with MUC4. And usually they look different from low-grade fiber mixoid sarcoma, but I've seen very rare examples uh, where there were very well differentiated areas in a synovial sarcoma that kind of had a fibrous look and looked similar similar to low-grade fiber mixoid sarcoma. So in that case, uh, obviously you could use other stains like keratins, and if you like TLE1, you could do that. And then in the end, if you have trouble, molecular pathology can help us out. Like I said earlier, these tumors, low-grade fiber mixoid sarcoma, is defined by a translocation. The most common translocation is the translocation 716, which is between um, the genes FUS, F-U-S, and CREB 3L2. And there's also um, a small subset of these that have an alternate translocation, which is between the uh, FUS gene and the CREB 3L1 gene. So FUS CREB 3L2 or FUS CREB 3L1 gene fusion can support the diagnosis. So you could use break apart fish for FUS. If the tumor looks like this and FUS is, is positive for FUS rearrangement, then you should be pretty good uh, in calling it a low-grade fiber mixoid sarcoma. But do be aware that there are many other tumors in soft tissue pathology that have FUS rearrangements, um, you know, mixoid liposarcoma and others. They usually have a different histologic appearance. So that's why you can never use, at least in my opinion, you shouldn't use molecular pathology by itself. You have to couple it with the clinical scenario and the histologic features and the immunostain findings. Put all of the picture together and make sure that the diagnosis makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, I always try to stop and think, what's wrong here? Is something not working? Is a test false positive? What's the problem? Why doesn't this all add up? Of course, there are rare exceptions to every rule, and that's how we you know, discover new things and publish new papers about weird, rare exceptions. But I think I always try first to think, maybe something, maybe something didn't work the right way here, or something is, is not making sense, and I try to think it through. Here's another example of that very collagenous, almost sclerotic areas with relatively low cellularity. You can even get this vague feeling of maybe kind of palisading in here, which could again give you this feel of a neural tumor. So it's one of those things too, if you think it looks like a neurofibroma but S100 is negative, then always think of low-grade fiber mixoid sarcoma in your differential. I know I'm harping on those things a lot, but it's because these are easy tumors to miss in practice uh, with bad results for everyone involved potentially. Here's an example that looks more mixoid. I think it still overall looks pink, but it does have a lot more of the pale, hypocellular kind of mixoid background. Look at that, there's a little bit more cellularity here. The cells are a little bit more round or even kind of triangle or so-called stellate shape here. And again, this is, a, this is a kind of pattern you could see in mixoid dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans too. They, the mixoid areas of DFSP tend to get these kind of triangle shaped or stellate cells. And so that's an important differential to keep in mind. CD34 usually is gonna solve the problem for you plus the clinical setting of whether the tumor is superficial or deep, okay? But again, the cells are very bland. You have kind of more cellular areas, less cellular areas, very little atypia. 
Here's some nice collagenous areas, and look, it's got branching vessels with dense sclerosis around those vessels. That's a pattern you could see in solitary fibrous tumor. Solitary fibrous tumor will usually be CD34 positive. This tumor, again, low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma is usually negative. I know I'm repeating myself a lot, but again, this is the goal that if you watch this whole video, you'll have had this drummed into your head so much that you'll easily remember all the details. Because to me, I think this, this tumor took me a while to, to pick up on it in my fellowship in sarcoma pathology. I really had to see quite a few examples to finally really catch the pattern. And now, usually, I think I recognize them very quickly when I see them. The reason I want to show this tumor is look at the vessels. This vessel pattern has been described in low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. It's not always there, but it's, it's a feature you see sometimes. And the, the vessels kind of have this arc shape. They're kind of little curves, like a little arch and the, or a little hairpin turn, like the vessel comes up and then loops and goes straight back in the direction it came. So you can see these vessels here. They're a little different than the vessels of, say, a uh, low-grade, I'm sorry, of a myxofibrosarcoma grade one. Myxofibrosarcomas, as I discussed in my other video, usually have these long, curving vessels. You can see vessels like that sometimes in, in this tumor, also in low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. But the, the kind of one of the classic vessel patterns is this, this, this arc shape, this curved arch of a vessel. And again, I mentioned um, that you can have some hyalinization or sclerosis around vessels. And here's a, here's a nice example of that. You can see over, over here in this area, you can really nicely see that these, these pink circles standing out, these are vessels, and you can really appreciate the arch shape here, this nice curved arch, little hook of a vessel. And there's so much collagen around the vessels, it really makes them stand out as pink. It's really a really dramatic pattern in this case. So very hyalinized, kind of pink stuff. It's so dense that you can not really even appreciate the vessel very clearly in many of these areas. But this perivascular hyalinization is a characteristic feature. And then take a look in the background here. Here's again the myxoid background. I really think this is very helpful. The very, very fine, delicate, collagen that you see. Now areas like this I think can kind of resemble what you see in a so-called cellular intramuscular myxoma. Intramuscular myxomas are usually very blue and myxoid, very hypocellular, but sometimes they get more fibrous and more cellular areas. <coughs> and on a needle biopsy, I think that can be challenging. So I think usually with some experience, you can tell them apart on H&E most of the time. But when I have any doubt, I just do a MUC4 stain. The MUC4 is negative, and on a needle, it looks like a myxoma with some kind of fibrous or a little bit more cellular areas. And then I just say that it's probably a cellular intramuscular myxoma. So I think MUC4 is a really helpful stain. And if you don't have it in your lab, um, you can send out and get it done at outside labs too. All right, so uh, again, uh, the, when you have the whole tumor removed, it's pretty easy to tell that this is not an intramuscular myxoma. Intramuscular myxomas usually have a very distinct appearance uh, once you have the entire tumor, but on a needle biopsy, it could be more problematic. So really nice example of that perivascular collagen deposition. Here you can see one of the open lumens of the vessel in the middle here and see how the collagen is surrounding it. So that perivascular hyalinization is a really nice clue when you see it and the arced uh, arcuate or curved arch shaped vessels and other useful finding. Now here's another case and this one kind of breaks the rule. I told you that these tumors fibro comes before myxoid and usually they're more fibrous. Well every rule has some exceptions. Here's one that looks more blue and more myxoid at first glance. Again you could kind of think oh it's myxoid it's not very cellular does it have atypia? And you go look and you don't see much atypia. Then is it myxofibrosarcoma? No, those have to have at least scattered pleomorphism. So you might think, is it a cellular myxoma? Well, you could wonder about that, but overall I don't think so because usually you'll have classic myxoma areas in a cellular myxoma. And this tumor doesn't really have that. And this tumor also is very vascular. There's a lot of, of increased, there's an increased number of small vessels. Usually uh, intramuscular myxomas tend to be relatively sparse on the number of vessels they have. These tumors tend to have a prominent vascular network. And then look, you start getting into areas like this where the blue myxoid background starts to get more of that delicate fine collagen. If you can't see it, again, you can flip the condenser and look at those tiny little threads of collagen evenly spread out in this myxoid background. Look at those spindle cells, very, very thin and bland and not atypical at all in this case. So when I start seeing background like that, 
and fibrous stuff mingling with mixoid stuff, right away I go ahead and make sure I work it up, do a MUC4 or send it out for molecular testing to make sure that you're not missing a low grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. Now, I've been telling you and highlighting how important it is to know that these tumors don't have atypia. Now, again, that's another rule that's sometimes broken. I think it's important to learn that the most common uh, the most common appearance is a benign looking tumor that doesn't look atypical. That's important because I think that's the one, those are the ones that are easy to miss. But it is worth noting that a subset, a small subset, maybe around 10% of cases, can have areas with increased cellularity, scattered pleomorphism, a round cell or epithelioid cell appearance. There have also been rare reports of, of cases that truly have a full-blown high-grade pleomorphic sarcoma-like appearance, like that they've transitioned into high-grade sarcoma, or I think even osteosarcomatous areas have been described. These are all really rare exceptions to the rule, but I, and I think it's, again, much more important for the general pathologist to know th this very bland, benign-looking appearance because this is the one that's going to be easy to misdiagnose and, and diagnose it as something benign when it's actually malignant. So again here, look at the alternation, more cellular stuff less cellular stuff. Very helpful to see this kind of zonation and swirling intermingling of more and less cellular areas of pink fibrous areas and blue myxoid areas. But do remember that there are exceptions to the rule and that sometimes pleomorphism is seen. It's just really uncommon. Also, mitotic activity, I don't think I mentioned it yet. Mitoses um, are usually very, very low in this tumor. If you see, I think the general rule is if you're, unless you're a sarcoma pathology expert, and even then, if I see, even as a sarcoma pathologist, if I see marked pleomorphism, a lot of mitotic activity, um, other features like that, I'm probably gonna send the case for molecular testing just to be totally sure that it's a, um, a low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma um, and not some other mimic. So uh, experts, uh, you know, sometimes we can look at stuff and say, oh yeah, that, that is fine, but I think that it, pleomorphism and um, uh, mitotic activity that are increased are rare enough in this tumor that I want to make sure I at least have immunostain, if not molecular, proof that the tumor really is a low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma before accepting those, those unusual variations in the histologic features. Here again, we have these kind of small curved vessels, and this one has a little bit more of a fascicular appearance in the myxoid zone. You can see these kind of short fascicles where the spindle cells are all kind of running in the same direction here. So sometimes you can have short fascicles, Again, that kind of characteristic background of fine collagen. And again, a very nice example of more fibrous on the right, more myxoid on the left, variation in cellularity. See, they really do this. Oh, see, here's one of the exceptions that has some areas of really relatively increased cellularity there. The cells have a little bit more of a rounded kind of oval to round uh, look, but they still in this case don't have pleomorphism. So again, I'm just, and oh, this is a good example too of how you can have those sclerotic zones that are, look at the transition there from really quite cellular in this case, much more cellular than usual, transitioning into a sclerotic zone that you might, if you weren't familiar with this tumor, you might actually not even recognize that this is really part of the tumor, but it is. Look at this area here. These are tumor cells mingling in to just a very hypocellular sclerotic collagen rich zone in this example of low grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. So this is I think a really good one from low power to see the variability in the cellularity and in the color, pink and blue, cellular and hypocellular all mingled together. Good example of low grade fibromyxoid sarcoma and out here you can tell we're down deep, there's skeletal muscle at the edge. And uh, sometimes there can be a little infiltration, but in my experience at least, most of these tumors are relatively well circumscribed and uh, they don't often infiltrate adjacent tissue, at least in the ones that I've seen. Now here's a variant that is important to know about. From low power even you can tell, this looks very different from what I've been showing you because it has these big pink circles, right? These big round pink areas. And then the background you can tell is kind of more cellular around these pink areas. So if you go down to the higher power, let's take a look, what are these pink, these pink circles? Kind of like crop circles or something made out of collagen. These pink areas are indeed collagen. They're very dense collagen. And these are called rosettes, collagen rosettes, okay? And the rosettes are very hypocellular. And then around the edge of the rosette, you tend to see kind of more rounded or epithelioid cells. Let me see if I can find a good area. 
you can see the, the cells are kind of clustering up. Sometimes they get more round and epithelioid. This particular case isn't quite that way. But they're kind of rounding up and getting more cellular around the rim of these, uh, these collagen rosettes. So this tumor has been in the past described as hyalinizing spindle cell tumor with giant rosettes. And we now recognize um, and have immunohistochemical and molecular proof that this is just a morphologic variation of low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. So I'll still mention this oftentimes um, in the report just uh, as a kind of a comment that this tumor has the unique pattern of hyalinizing spindle cell tumor with giant rosettes. But in my line diagnosis, I would co still call this low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma because it is low-grade fibromyxoid. And look again how dense the collagen is in this area. This is that sclerotic kind of area. It really has almost like a tiger stripe or palisade looking pattern, particularly when you have it on the, uh, the, um, the condenser flipped here. You can see this unique collagen pattern in this particular tumor. And I don't know, but I kind of suspect that these collagen rosettes may be related to the hyalinization in collagen that we see around smaller vessels, like I showed in that tumor, er the example earlier, that this may just be a more dramatic example. Now, one other tumor that might enter the differential here is the so-called neuroblastoma-like variant of schwannoma or neurilamoma, neuroblastoma-like schwannoma. It has also big collagen-rich rosettes like this, but it has a much more prominent round cell appearance around the edge of the rim of the nodules. Are very like small round blue cell, almost look a little bit like the small round blue cells of a neuroblastoma, which is why it's named that way. But I've definitely seen um, pathologists have trouble telling those two apart, telling a hyalinizing spindle cell tumor with giant rosettes this tumor we're looking at here, a variation of low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. I've seen people get that confused with the neuroblastoma-like variant of schwannoma. And the difference is important because the schwannoma is, even though the name sounds kind of scary, is actually benign. It has a small round blue cell appearance, but it's a totally benign variation of schwannoma. S100 should e easily solve that problem because S100 um, would be negative here in low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma and positive in the schwannoma. So it's just important to recognize that that's one other tumor that can have collagen rosettes like that are kind of like this. Uh, the different, there is a bit of a difference once you've seen them, but they're both rare. Uh, both this tumor and the, the neuro, neuroblastoma-like uh, variant of schwannoma are both rare tumors. So, uh, you know, people have seen a picture of this in a book and they think, oh, that's that thing that has the, the pink collagen rosettes. Just remember that there are other things that can have that too. Here again, bland spindle cells and short fascicles, kind of wavy, kind of a neuralish appearance. Again, I like to teach my residents, I think I've mentioned this in other videos, but that when, a, when spindle cells look really wavy, sharply wavy, and when you flip the condenser and you can see that the actual collagen fibers are really wavy up and down, that usually is a sign that you're dealing with a fibroblastic proliferation, not a neural proliferation. Neural proliferations are gently wavy, gently undulating, and usually not strikingly wavy like this. My fellow Ed Fulton, my Dirt Path fellow from, uh, from last year, he loves to say, he told me that he thought so the collagen here looks kind of like ramen noodles, the dry ramen noodles when they first come out of the package. Uh, if you don't know what that looks like, you should A, buy some ramen noodles and eat them because they're good, and also you should go do, do a Google image search and you can see what ramen noodles in a package look like. And I think it's a great example, and I, I'm going to start calling that the ramen noodle sign of Fulton in his honor because I think it's a perfect visual example of how super wavy the collagen gets, and that's a good sign, again, of fibroblastic, not neural. So we teach that neural things are wavy, but I think that's actually kind of, uh, kind of not a helpful thing to teach because then what happens is a lot of pathologists see waviness like this and they think, oh, it's a nerve tumor. And actually it's not. It's usually fibroblastic when it's this wavy. So again, a short spindle cell fascicles here, bland spindle cells. So the background stuff in between the hyaline rosettes, uh, are, they just look like uh, basically like other low-grade fibromyxoid sarcomas. Um, and have those bland spindle cells in the alternating areas of cellularity. So hyalinizing spindle cell tumor with giant rosettes, or with, yeah, with giant rosettes, a, a nice example, uh, again, of a, of a unique and interesting pattern in low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. Now this one's a little bit different from the others I've shown you, so I wanted to include it also. Again, it breaks the rule because it's more blue and mixoid rather than pink. So it doesn't, that rule doesn't always work, but I think as it, it, in general, if you expect them to be pink, uh, that will be helpful. But sometimes they can be very mixoid. But this one does follow the rule of alternating cellularity. More cellular stuff here, much less cellular out here. 
The cells are very bland and very small. Over here, we have much more cellular areas. And again, look at that collagen, the delicate collagen in the background, I think. Very, very fine, thin threads of collagen starting to, to trickle into the myxoid background. Really helpful. Look at how benign those cells look. Gosh, it'd be impossible, I think, on cytology, I've got an FNA, to recognize that this is a malignancy. It'd be very hard. On a core biopsy, with some experience, you can do it. But man, I, any cytopathologist that can do it, I give them um, a hat tip for being that awesome. And I give them a hat tip anyway because cytopathology is hard. So those guys who do that, the, the ladies and uh, gentlemen who do cytopath are amazing. All right, the vascularity here, you can see there's some increased vascularity in the background. This is too cellular, in my opinion, to be a myxoma, okay, for one thing. So if you're thinking about myxoma, I think that's out, too cellular. The variation in cellularity should right away make you think a low-grade fiber myxoid sarcoma, even though it's more myxoid than fibrous. And this one has a little bit of kind of fascicular, more broad fascicles here. Like that, see all the cells are kind of streaming the same direction. So one thing you could consider here, I think, would be, uh, would be a, a dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans, a myxoid DFSP. Uh, DFSPs, particularly as they transform into a higher grade form, they can begin to get kind of fascicular, almost herringbone areas. And even though this isn't nearly as cellular as a, a fibrous sarcoma, as DFSP, I think still seeing a myxoid, uh, bland spindle cell thing that has, that has areas like this could really make me wonder, am I dealing with um, a, a DFSP. And DFSPs that get more cellular and fibrous sarcoma, sometimes they lose expression of CD34. I'll make a video about DFSP at some point in the future uh, that'll go over all this in detail. So anyway, you could do molecular testing there. DFSP has a translocation between the collagen 1A1, PDGF beta genes, and again here we have the FUS uh, CREB 3L2 or 3L1 translocation. So molecular testing could sort this out if you had trouble. And of course, MUC4 should be helpful too. Finally, I'm gonna show one last example. And then I think you'll have seen uh, nine different cases of low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. It usually would take uh, quite a few years of practice to have seen that many cases. Now here's a case, and here's lung tissue over here. This was a case that metastasized to the lung and pleura. But even the metastasis has features that resemble the original. More cellular areas on the right, mingling with less cellular, very sclerotic areas over here on the left. Really dramatic perivascular hyalinization. Again, starting, you can see how the perivascular hyalinization here is starting to get bigger and resemble those collagen rosettes I showed you in the hyalinizing spindle cell tumor with giant rosettes example. And here, this one actually, this is, is basically a little rosette. It's got a vessel in the middle. But look, what we're seeing here on the edge is what's described that you often see. The other case didn't show it nicely. But around the edge of the rosettes, the cells tend to get more round and almost epithelioid and kind of cluster around the edge of the rosette. So I think that's a really good example here of, um, of kind of a collagen rosette and the uh, larger kind of more round but still very bland and monomorphic uniform cells that surround the edge of the collagen rosettes. Um, when you see those rosettes in this tumor. So collagen rosettes in a fibroblastic tumor should be an instant clue that you're probably dealing with a low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. But do remember, again, that some variants of schwannoma can also have rosettes. Um, and so be sure not to confuse those. Immunostains can help you out there. So I hope that you liked this video and that this helped sort this out. Um, again, make sure that you've checked out my um, you know, five minute approach to telling apart low grade fibromyxoid sarcoma from myxofibrosarcoma comma grade one. And also watch the full length feature uh, video about myxofibrosarcoma. And then I think after seeing this video and those two videos, you should have a really solid handle on how to tell these tumors apart. I made these videos and went so in depth because I find that, that pathologists often really struggle with these because the names sound so much alike and, and uh, those of us in soft tissue pathology who publish papers, maybe we haven't helped the general pathology public so much by making names that all sound so similar. So I hope the video has helped. If you liked it, please click like down below and um, leave comments or questions in the comment section. And of course, make sure you've subscribed to my channel if you haven't yet so that you'll be notified about new videos that I post in the future. Thanks so much for watching.